Hi, Donald. Welcome to the show. We're very happy to have you. Thank you very much, and it's good to be with you. Cool. So um, I've been watching a bunch of your lectures and uh, started on your book, and Mike has almost finished it. So um, I thought that your theories were uh, very different from what is uh, in the mainstream science right now. But at the same time, I found them to be very intuitive. And um, there's a lot that overlaps with my own insights that I've had in meditation. There's something about this idea of consciousness being primary and everything else uh, arising in consciousness that, um, that seems to uh, come as a common insight with doing a lot of meditation. So I was wondering if uh, how you came to have these theories and if you have your own contemplative practice or if it was from something else. Yes, I, I do have my own meditative practice, but it's only been for the last 17 years. So I, I started working on this idea that consciousness is fundamental long before I took seriously the idea of even meditating at all. And it was primarily because of certain scientific problems that we were having in my field. In my, I'm in cognitive neuroscience, and we study brain activity and its relationship to human behavior and human perception and emotion and, and intelligence and so forth. And, and we, we're quite successful. Uh, it's remarkable how many aspects of human cognition we can explain. Um, you know, learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, language acquisition. We're getting to the point where we can, you know, ideas that have come out of cognitive neuroscience and uh, computational vision have led to uh, robotic uh, cars, you know, that can drive themselves and so forth. So it's, it's been spectacularly successful, but there's one problem where we have utterly failed. And that's where you would think it would be the most simple, which is just basic experiences like the taste of vanilla, the, you know, the, the, the smell of a rose. These very elementary conscious experiences seem to elude us. We have many examples of neural correlates of these experiences. So, you know, we can have tight correlations between color experience and activity in area V4 of, of, of visual cortex and, and, um, motion experience and area v5 activity and so forth but we've not been able to come up with a scientific theory that starts with neural activity as an unconscious physical process and with mathematical precision boot up a specific conscious experience like the taste of chocolate or something like that we we, we simply can't do it there's not a single neuroscience theory or um, you know, computer science theory, you know, that does it with you know, maybe some kind of a uh, computer program that starts with a program or a neuroscience uh, model of uh, some architecture in the brain or, and its activity. And without a hand wave gives you the precise conditions in which a specific conscious experience like the taste of vanilla arises and explains exactly why that taste must arise from that kind of neural activity or that kind of program and why it couldn't be the smell of chocolate or, you know, a headache or something like that. And, and it, it was that utter failure of science in my field to solve that what seems like a simple problem that has really made me step back and question the very foundations of, of the field, right? And, and this is not unusual. It's quite common for a scientific theory to be spectacularly successful in a, a wide range of domains and yet have a couple little that look like little areas where it's falling apart and history has repeatedly shown us that when you pay attention to where the theories fall apart that's where you get your biggest insights so newton's theory of physics was spectacularly successful in almost everything for centuries, but it couldn't deal with something called the Michelson-Morley experiments where light, the behavior of light wasn't what we expected. It didn't seem to change its speed. And something called black body radiation where things were glowing when they heated up in a way that wasn't predicted by Newton. And for many physicists, this was just, oh, these are little minor things, Newton is good. But it turned out when we took those, those problems seriously, Michelson-Morley experiment um, pointed the way to Einstein's theory of relativity and the black box radiation, uh, black body 
radiation um, pointed the way to quantum theory and quantum field theory. And those were revolutionary. And so that's my attitude about cognitive neuroscience. It's spectacularly successful at almost everything. That means it's getting a lot in some sense, very, very right. But we're very wise to look at where it's falling down and it falls down dramatically on consciousness. And so that's why I focus there. <clears throat> and the reason I decided to take consciousness as fundamental instead of space, time and physical objects like neurons <clears throat> was that it was the only way I could think of to solve this scientific problem. If I can't start with unconscious physical systems, computers or neurons in space and time and boot up consciousness, then the only other way, you know, it's poverty of my imagination. The only other way I could think of of trying to solve this problem is to say, well, okay, let me start with the theory of consciousness on its own terms, not as derived from anything else. Consciousness is fundamental. Try to get a mathematically precise theory of that and then try to boot up space and time and, you know, neurons and, and computers and so forth. Um, so I'm trying to go the, the other direction. And every scientific theory makes assumptions. And that sounds quite innocuous. Of course, assumptions, ho-hum. But really, assumptions are miracles for that theory. An assumption is a fact or a proposal that the theory is saying, please grant me this proposal. Please grant me this assumption. If you grant me this, I can explain all this other stuff. But the theory can't explain its own assumptions, right? It, the assumptions are the assumptions. They're the, so I like to call them miracles because that's where explanation stops for that theory. Now, of course, <clears throat> you can always then try to get a deeper theory that explains the assumptions that you made in, in a prior theory. But the new theory will have its own new assumptions, right? There's no such thing as a theory of everything. And so, so my attitude about this is, right now, most of my colleagues are assuming space and time and physical objects like particles, protons and neutrons, and, and then bigger objects like neurons and brains. <clears throat> and they say, if you grant me space, time and particles, I can explain all this other stuff and I'll try to explain consciousness, but, but they failed to explain consciousness. So consciousness is for them still a mystery. So I'm saying, okay, grant me these assumptions about consciousness. I'll give you a mathematical model of consciousness, but I'm assuming that consciousness is fundamental. So yeah, it, for me, it is a miracle, although I'm describing the miracle with mathematics, but it is a miracle. But if I can start there, and then show how I can explain how space, time, and physical objects arise, then I have fewer miracles than them. Because for them right now, space, time, and, and particles are a miracle, and consciousness is a miracle. So by starting with consciousness as my only miracle and showing that I can get space, time, and particles, I have fewer miracles than them. So I'm better off. And so that's sort of how, you know, it's a long answer to the question, but that's why I decided to go at it this way. Um, I'm trying to have fewer miracles than they have right now. Um, so that's, but then later on, uh, about you know, 17, 18 years ago, I began a contemplative process of meditation, just pure silence, no particular orientation or religion or anything like that, just, just silence. <clears throat> and that I think has helped the development of my ideas. But it, it started first with the mathematics um, and the open problem in my field. But uh, it's nice that the contemplative practice then feeds into it and helps me have more insights about um, consciousness since that's now sort of the, the focus of my scientific study. <clears throat> Can you expand on your theory for those who haven't read the book? Right, so the, the idea is that space and time and particles like protons and neutrons and quarks and gluons <clears throat> are not the fundamental nature of reality. And that's a big leap, right? Physics for centuries has been about what happens inside space-time. That's what physics has been. Um, and on evolutionary grounds that I can go into if, you, if you'd like, um, I realized that evolution by natural selection entails that we have to let go of space-time. It's not fundamental. And 
physical particles in, inside space-time can't be fundamental either. The very language of space-time can't describe objective reality. And so that was one reason why I was realizing that neurons and compu you know, computation can't boot up consciousness. That's very, it's not even the nature of objective reality. So the proposal is that objective reality is like a vast social network of conscious agents, of consciousnesses. So it's, it's a big social network. And, and where the science comes in is I have a mathematically precise definition of what a conscious agent is, it involves probability theory and Markovian kernels and so forth. And the network of agents is also a mathematically precise structure. It's, it's multigraph theory and so forth. And so we're looking at dynamics on multigraphs and Markovian dynamics. But, but intuitively, what it's about is a vast social network of interacting conscious agents. And one of the interesting properties of it is that when agents interact, they create new agents. It just follows from the math. When two agents interact, their interaction satisfies the definition of a conscious agent. So it is a new conscious agent. That's uh, just how you play this game. And so we get this vast network of conscious agents interacting, creating new agents. We have very, very simple agents that uh, might only have one or two experiences, call them one-bit agents, but they can combine to create two-bit agents, four-bit agents, up to infinity. So we get infinite consciousnesses coming out of this theory, but we have mathematical control. So, so it's when you have infinite consciousnesses, that's what most people would think is now you're in the, the realm of spirituality, which is very, very interesting. But we now have, for the first time that I know of, a mathematical theory. Now, I'm not saying it's right, but in fact, I'll say I'm probably wrong, but the point is to be mathematically precise so you can figure out precisely where you're wrong. So what's, what's fun for me is, even though I'm probably wrong, for the first time that I know of, we have a mathematically precise theory of consciousness on the table in which consciousness itself is fundamental, not derived from neurons or microtubules and their collapses or causal computational structures of physical systems. It's consciousness on its own terms, and it leads naturally to a theory of infinite consciousnesses. And so for the first time, we have a precise theory of what we might call spirituality. Again, it's probably wrong, but at least it's precise so we can now begin the scientific process of figuring out where it's wrong. And the interesting thing is that this theory then leads naturally to ways of booting up space-time and I believe all of quantum field theory um, and general relativity. We're working, you know, my team is working on that, but the idea is to start with the dynamics of conscious agents and the long-term behavior, what's called the asymptotic behavior of conscious agents is what physics is seeing. So they're not seeing, the reason it doesn't look like consciousness to them is they're not seeing the detailed dynamics of these conscious agents. They're only seeing the long-term behaviors. It, it's, it would be like, suppose you're flying in a helicopter over um, a bunch of busy roads. From your high point of view, you just see these dots moving along the streets and the freeways and so forth. And if you tried to model it, you might use you know, differential equations and dynamical systems and so forth um, that, that have unconscious particles moving around on the streets. And you could, you could model it that way and it would be quite effective, like a fluid dynamics kind of model. What you're not seeing though from the helicopter's point of view is that each one of those dots has a conscious being that's hitting the brake, turning the wheel, hitting the gas, doing all those things. And so you, you miss all that when you're looking at the long-term asymptotic behavior. And so that's what I'm proposing is going on here. The reason why physics has looked and not seen any consciousness is because they only get to look at the asymptotic behavior, the helicopter point of view. And that's no surprise because they're starting not from consciousness itself, they're starting from what we can see. And all we can see in space and time, I'm proposing, is the asymptotic behavior. So that's why they, everywhere they look, they, do, they see no evidence of consciousness. Of course, when they look in the mirror, 
when they look at themselves, they have firsthand evidence of their own consciousness. And so that becomes a mysterious thing. How come everywhere we look with our scientific tools, we see no consciousness, but when I look in the mirror, I see consciousness staring me in the face. And so that's the, the dilemma that I'm trying to resolve with the theory of consciousness, where we understand how consciousness works with mathematical precision, and then sh explain why physics hasn't seen consciousness. And the reason is they only see the asymptotic behavior of consciousness, not the step-by-step -step detailed behavior of consciousness. The brand new Future Thinkers members portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses, get access to our weekly sense-making calls, join the Q&As with past podcast guests, and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. Enter the Future Thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership, including in-depth courses, private calls, and more, as well as a supply of Qualia, a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain. To enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today.